In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's nothing new under the sun, brethren. In all generations, in all cultures, in all times, there have been doubts aplenty. If we look at the first century of the church, we look at the writings of St. Paul, he combats doubts. Of course, doubts about who Jesus is. But specifically in terms of heresy in the New Testament, he speaks about those who doubt that God is truly man, that God would truly suffer. These are called the docetists, the docetic heresy. He speaks against this in the first century. Gnosticism is very similar to this, denying the reality of the human present with God. If we jump forward three centuries to the time of our own patron, St. Athanasius, there were doubts about Jesus being truly divine, right? Could this Jesus really be God? Or is he something else? There were doubts about this that St. Athanasius would preach against when he spoke against the Arians. A hundred years after that, at the time of Nestorius, there was this cr puzzle in the minds of many of the Orthodox Christians, particularly Nestorius and his friends, how could God and man co inhere in one person? Can we really call Jesus, at all points in his development, God? Or was there a time, perhaps, when he wasn't really fully God? He became God, perhaps. He grew into God. There are doubts about how the human and the divine coexist in Christ. We jump to what we came to last week the triumph of Orthodoxy in 843, the whole 100 year saga of the icons being persecuted and defended back and forth. There were doubts as to whether we could depict our God who was before uncircumscribable, now circumscribable. Can we depict him in an icon? Can we do that or is that impious? Is that wrong? There were doubts and concerns and fear about these things. And today we get to another doubt that the church reckons with head-on. And the question that was in the minds of our 14th century fathers at the time of the Polemite controversy, which we celebrate today, was the question of, can God really be present with me? Can he who is without beginning, he who we dare not speak of in his essence, can we dare to say this God is in me? This God is with me. This God is truly part of my life. That I can even see Him. That I can feel Him. That I can know Him. Can I dare to say that? And there are doubts about that. So let's talk about this feast this morning. The character that I really love when we look at this feast is the character of Barlaam the Calabrian. He's the bad guy in this feast, right? He is St. Gregory. Today is called the Sunday of St. Gregory Palamas. Barlaam was the bad guy in the story. But Barlaam is a very interesting man. Barlaam was what you might call a, a sort of cool Orthodox convert. He was an incredibly gifted man from Italo, the Italo-Byzantine region of Italy, at the bottom of the, of, the, of the boot there called Calab Calabria. That was an area with Greek and Latin influence. There were some Orthodox, some Catholics intermingling there. The Byzantine Empire had been there years before, but not recently. But he was a man who converted most likely, to orthodoxy as an adult. He was extremely bright. He was sort of a celebrity. He was like the Peter Gilquist of his day. He converted. I'm sorry, it's not fair to Father Peter. But, I mean, Father Peter's wonderful. God bless his soul. But he was celebrated. It was kind of like a rock star. He went to the imperial city and was, was feted by the, by the emperor. He was given an appointment at a, at a, at a university there. He was made a teacher of the fathers. He was an expert on St. Dionysius, the Areopagite. He really loved, uh, in the teachings of our father Dionysius, he loved the statements about God's, um, well, the apophatic teachings, the teachings that God, you don't dare speak about what God truly is because, because it's better to speak about what he's not. And it's a sort of great care in Dionysius to, to not overdefine God, which is a major feature of our orthodox understanding of theology. We, we don't dare say too much about him. We say only what's been revealed. 
So we say in our liturgy, he's ineffable, inconceivable, without beginning, without end. These things that are, are negations, he's beyond our reasoning, beyond our understanding. And, and Barlam loved all of that. He renounced the filioque. He renounced the errors of the papacy as we understand them. He was very orthodox. He was a monk. He went to Mount Athos for a while, but he preferred the imperial city. He was made an abbot there. And while he was there, he began to really teach strongly that we encounter God. Not directly, but by, as we understand the dogmas of the church, we can then raise our minds up to God and become saved. As we consider the teachings of the church, as we mentally assent to what has been given to us in the church, we grow spiritually. We become what we're supposed to be. Now, that's not all wrong. But in the midst of his teaching, he came across another man about his same age, St. Gregory Palamas, who had been uh, also from a very um, uh, influential family. He had been a, a confidant of the emperor. The emperor was grooming him to become his prime minister. But Gregory disappointed the emperor by running off to a monastery. He went to Manathos and spent 20 years basically as a recluse and as a cinematic monk, living very piously on the holy mountain, praying, <coughs> immersing himself in the life of God, and becoming what Barlam would disparage. He became a hesychastic monk. And that hesychasm is a term in Greek that, defer, that refers to stillness. Gregory and the monks on Manathos were seeking stillness in God. And as they prayed the Jesus prayer, as they did the things that they did as monks, they had a deep and abiding awareness of the real presence of God in their midst. And they even said we would see the divine light, like the light that shone from Moses in the Old Testament, or the light that we saw, the disciples saw, from Jesus on Mount Tabor, the uncreated light, the very life of God, we are perceiving, and we dare not speak too much about it, but this is our experience. And the only reason they spoke about it, by the way, is that, Saint, that Barlam was insulting that idea. And so to defend it, they had to speak about what they were experiencing. I want to read a quote to you from Gregory about why he defended the Hesychast, why he said stillness is indeed the living encounter of God. He says this, If anyone agrees about the reality, we will not quibble about the words. For truth and piety, according to Gregory the Theologian, reside not in words, but in things. My concern here is not with words, but with anyone who argue, argues about the realities. I will not quibble about words or syllables, but I will be concerned about the realities that are being proclaimed by these people. He was concerned with the reality of the Christian life. And to express clearly what he felt the teaching of the church was, Gregory sort of dug up some of the teachings of the old Cappadocian fathers about God and proclaimed them boldly. He taught that we can know God not in his essence. His essence is, as St. Dionysius the Areopagite says, beyond our understanding. It's, it's the unknown. It's the cloud of unknowing. But we can know God in his energies, his energia, in his activities, in his, in his dispensation, and his law for mankind, and what God does. We can know him truly and, and, and in reality, know the Lord, and have him living and abiding in us and with us. And the example he gave you, probably many of you already know, the example is the fire and the sword. There's a fire, which Gregory likens to God. And the fire has the property, or the energia, of heat, right? Then there's a sword, which is like the human nature. It's steel. Steel remains steel. But when we get close to God, when we contemplate God, when we do what Gregory is saying we must do, which is to pray and be still with God, the sword, which is cold, enters the heat of the fire, enters the flame. It doesn't become flame, but it acquires the energia, the energy, the activity of the heat, becomes now the heat of the sword, and the sword glows. It becomes like fire, remaining, as it were, steel. And this is an image, a parable for us to consider. We become like God. 
In our church, we have this teaching of theosis. It literally means in Greek to become God, to become like God. We believe salvation looks like our becoming, taking on the qualities and the activities of the Lord Jesus Christ, revealed, revealing the Father in the Holy Spirit. It looks like that work in the saints were to become like that, taking on all the heat and all the properties of the fire, the properties of divinity are to become ours. Not in our essence, but in our activities, in our energies, in our life. And that is indeed real. That is indeed God. That is indeed God at work in our hearts and in our lives. And brethren, in our day, there are so many doubts about God and about all of the, the, the theology. And our task is not to deny any of that theology. Varlam had most of his theology right. He was absolutely correct about 99% of things. That wasn't his problem. His problem, though, was that he didn't realize the best weapon against the doubt and the best weapon against the world <clears throat> is not our sharpened theology or our wit. He was known for being witty. It's, it's indeed being immersed in the flame, being, being in the fire, being in God, being with God, being transformed by the properties of the living God. And that, brethren, is the greatest tool God gives us against doubt. Not only out there, but in here. Because our, our doubts, so many times, are right here in our own hearts. Our own inability to live the gospel out. Thinking, perhaps, it's about assent. Or it's about doing things. about a method. And there's a method in orthodoxy. But it's not about that. We have a method, but it's not about that. The method is there to take us to the fire, to the living God, who can purge us and heal us and make a cold steel become hot as fire. This is the vision our Father Gregory gives us this morning. And it's this thing we celebrate as a second triumph of orthodoxy. Right? We celebrated the icons last week. This week we celebrate the reality that we can become like God now. That God's incarnation in Christ is now effective in my life and in your life as we seek to become truly the image and likeness of God. May God help us in this Lent to uncover that image, to enter the fire, and become truly Christ-like. To Him belongs glory, honor, and worship now and ever to ages of ages. Amen.